Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, Certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. Chat AI and energy. I've posted before about chatbots and sustainability, separately from an architect's point of view. I learned recently about the energy consumption involved in developing and operating these chat AIs, like ChatGPT, for example. I can't do it justice here, but I urge you, go take a look. I was horrified. I expected it to be quite excessive, partly as the whole setup doesn't work on the basis of ruthless frugality. And of course, the promulgation of many siloed bots, as I've said before, simply replicates the energy cost. So ignoring the debate between the trustworthiness and the threat of these AI models or the opportunities that they present, as responsible architects, we need to make their sustainability footprints a key concern and an architectural risk for us. I can easily see technical debt not being measured in dollars, but in energy footprint as a result of this explosion in AI chat models. Welcome everyone to Toolkit Tuesday um, and uh, a great Thank you, as usual, to um, Paul Homan, very on topic there. Paul Homan, distinguished engineer at IBM uh, and member of the Open Group Governing Board. Um, Paul always used to have, uh, always seems to have some uh, some good thoughts here and uh, teeing us up to think about the uh, the carbon uh, impact of uh, the latest AI developments and ChatGBT. It's a perfect topic for today um, where we are going to be talking about uh, some of the work that the Open Group um, has been doing uh, in the Open Footprint Forum uh, around that very topic. But uh, before we do, um, just a quick bit of housekeeping. As I say, welcome to, uh, to you wherever you are. Thank you for uh, joining us. Great to have you with us. And uh, we... Uh, we're delighted um, to to have people join us from all over the world. Uh, those of you who are regulars will hear me say this uh, not all the time, but nearly all the time. Um, it's great to know that we are a global community and that uh, the work that we all do together uh, has an impact globally. And uh, none more so than uh, uh, it's not no more no more top, no topic is more important than today's topic um, for that having a global impact. But uh, just a quick quick item, uh, if you'd like to ask a question of today's speaker, then please do that through the Q&A channel uh, in the WebEx tool. And if you can't see the Q&A channel, please uh, click on the three little dots in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and that will give you the opportunity to click on uh, Q&A. So please ask that, uh, ask any questions through there. And please uh, encourage you to use the chat channel. As I said, we're spread all over the all over the world. So uh, let us know where you're joining us from. Let us let your other uh, fellow attendees know where you're joining us from. Um, I kicked it off. Uh, welcome from Sonoma County, California, where we have normal service resumed on the weather, which hasn't been the case so far this year. Uh, but we needed the rain. So without without further ado, our topic today is is the work, as I say, the work that we're being we're doing inside the open group um, on carbon emissions measurement. And as you know, climate change and the impacts of carbon are becoming more material every day uh, and the world is recognizing the impacts. There isn't a day goes by where we don't see something about the impacts, risks or opportunities around this topic. And over the past several years, the Open Group's been working collaboratively across multiple industries, technology, consulting, academia and other groups 
to establish a standardized data model to enable the accurate and timely reporting and sharing of carbon data. As you'll hear, that's, uh, that's a challenge without, uh, without some work being done. Companies need to have a level of trust to influence and improve their sustainability impact, and that trust is increased by having a well-aligned data model. So uh, today our, our focus is on that data model, and we uh, are delighted to have with us um, Mr. A.J. van der Voort. So, uh, A.J., welcome. Um, A.J. is a customer-focused, results-oriented global executive with more than 28 years of experience with Fortune 500 companies in oil and gas, oil field services, consumer goods, automotive and government in most continents of the world. He's currently been 10 years with Intertech. Before that, he was with SAP for 15 years and he started his career uh, working on Unix systems, um, which is uh, a topic dear to uh, the hearts of folk at the Open Group, uh, still a, an important part of our world. So a warm welcome to Toolkit Tuesday for AJ van der Voort. Over Thank to you, you sir. Thank you, Steve, for the warm introduction and uh, greetings from sunny Florida. In the next 20 minutes, um, I'll be discussing our comprehensive standardized data model for carbon emissions. On the right, you can see the well-known image of the greenhouse gas protocol standard. It differentiates between direct and indirect emissions and scopes one, two, and three, providing clarity in order to avoid double counting. Now, OFP, which stands for Open Footprint Forum, has taken this concept and developed a versatile data standard focused on third-party verification by auditors, as regulators are mandating this on a global basis. That means companies need to have a level of trust in the data in order to influence and improve their sustainability impacts. And that trust is increased by having a well-aligned data model. More on that later. First, let's delve a bit deeper into the topic of standards. As you can see here at the bottom, there are various reporting standards and I only have put up a few. There are frameworks and as well alliances, like for example, the WBCSD, which stands for the World Business Council of Sustainable Development. And they outline the requirements for ESG and carbon reporting, yet often they overlook the technical details. And currently there is no established technical standard. OFP provides this. This enables companies and technology providers like hyperscalers, ERP software companies and other ESG tools to use the OFP standard and implement their own way for tracking, managing and exchanging the data, providing maximum flexibility and extensibility. As you can understand, there are many players in OFP's ecosystem, from policymakers, standard setters, auditors to technology companies. Many impactful partners are already engaged in the forum. And the following organizations have already committed to OFP, in total 288 members. They're organized in six working groups. Each working group meets once a week. Some groups are more technical, others are functionally around sustainability and regulators or more marketing related. I mentioned before, there is a reason why this is urgent. As regulators like the SEC, which stands for the Security and Exchange Commission, are mandating climate-related disclosure next to financials. The timeline here on the slide shows when the proposed law is expected to be final. As you can see at the bottom, the UK is already active and the SEC's final rule is expected this month, followed by Canada and Europe in the middle in the summer of this year. Based on this ruling, the blue arrow shows when carbon data collection should start. For example, in the UK, they require five years of historic data, 
once you file in Q3 2024. The SEC, however, requires two years of data. This means when the first filing is due in Q1 2025, you require to report on data from Q1 2023, which started a couple of months ago. Note as well when limited and re reasonable assurance is required. This means data quality is not optional. Today, most companies use thousands of spreadsheets as reporting is voluntary. In OFP, we've identified over 30 disclosure requirements that are consistent amongst the global sustainability regs that impact the data model. Here, a list of the first eight. For example, periods covered. As I mentioned in the previous slide, that the UK requires five years of data, including energy usage performance. I've highlighted that here in the bottom. Now, what does the data model look like? Here is a high level overview. Note the various entities and their relationships. I hope you can zoom in to look at that in more detail. At the bottom, you find the carbon emissions per product value chain entities as defined by the WBCSD scope three requirements for carbon data exchange. This is important because our alliance with WBCSD is quite critical. We even included product lifecycle analysis or LCA as the industry calls it. That means we are ready for the circular economy, a complete data model for all your sustainability needs. The next three slides show the basic concepts. The heart of the data model are the emission activities, either source or sink, and its calculations. You can build hierarchies like what you do in accounting, with the output being a statement, like with your financials of your greenhouse gas inventory, ready for the regulators. Here is an example of those activities and how they are calculated for an organization structure with its unique organizational, operational, or financial boundaries based on equity share or emission allocations. Each reg or regulation has different requirements. Last but not least, as I mentioned before, emissions per product. Remember that on each product that you buy from a supermarket, you'll find how much calories there are in this product. It is envisioned that it will be a time where each product will have as well, what is its carbon intensity? As per WBC is the requirements for data exchange in your supply chain, including life cycle analysis. And this diagram shows the depth and breadth of the data model. So what else makes OFP unique? And that's its architecture. As the model is built on a 21st century architecture with microservices and containerization for AI, IoT, big data, or blockchain. With an API-first approach, including the latest cybersecurity and DevOps environments from the world's latest hyperscalers with most microservices from Google Open Edition that you can run on either AWS, Azure, or GCP. That means maximum flexibility for independent software vendors or companies they want to use it as either a platform as a service called PaaS, a software as a service called SaaS, or a business process as a service and build cool apps and data insights on top of an open source OFP. So what about integration and interoperability? Well, there is something unique about common data. Most data is already there, 
either sitting in an ERP system in some form or thousands of spreadsheets. All you need to do is ingest it, enrich with calculations, and then consume and deliver to support a full life cycle of data. That's called sustainability building, be it for analytics, climate risk mitigation, life cycle analysis, carbon offsets, or just simply regulatory reporting. You don't need a monolith rigged ERP system with limited integration and interoperability. Even better, the Open Group has delivered this successfully with standardization of subsurface data called OSDU. OFP is using the same architecture with a different data model for all the data above surface. This is the last slide. We need your help. The data model is already developed. Of course, it can still be extended and it will evolve. We need your help with validating, extending and documentation. Please join us and you will see here the website link or you can contact Heidi Carlson, who is as well on this call. I'll pause here and hand it back to Steve for Q&A. Thank you. AJ, thank you very much. It was a, a whistle-stop tour um, of, uh, that represents an awful lot of, lot of work that's been going on. So uh, thank you very much for that and for um, setting it into a, a context that we can all understand, because after all, it's one of our, one of the, uh, as I said in the intro, one of the major topics we hear about every day is the, is the carbon emissions. So if I can just play you back, um, before I get to the questions, if I can just play you back uh, how I've, um, always understood this uh, and what we're doing and and that's that right now believe it or not there is no common way for um, uh, organizations for companies to to record and report their emissions data so they they all you know some of them are making great claims about you know zero by whatever date but it's based on on the the uh, set of standards that, and the models that they choose to use rather than anything that's consistent so you can't really compare apples with apples is is that about about fair that that that's about fair and and yeah. that is one of the principles of what we focused on at OFB is as well the very let me say it correctly verifiability of the right. data right? right so where do you get that number from like every auditor would ask when you, um, you know, a particular this time of year when taxes are due, right? That receipt that you gave me or that number that you have here, where did it come from, right? And can I trust that data? And because it's now mandated by the regulator, there are liabilities. So boards of directors worldwide, particularly of public companies, all are concerned about what's going to happen in the next couple of years. And they don't want to be held liability for data that is not somewhat accurate or reasonable accurate, right? Yeah, yeah, no, of course, of course. So, uh, as I said, different different organizations are using, you know, using what they can use at the moment or what they choose to use. So what makes what makes the work that's going on here um, different from other data models for greenhouse gas gas emissions? And that's a good, that's a great question, Steve, because, you know, as, as you've said in the introduction, I have a long uh, ERP background and uh, monolithic systems uh, mm -hmm. costing quite a lot of dollars to implement, right? I think the first thing that's exciting about OFP that it's built uh, on 21st century architecture, as I mentioned in one of the slides, right? Because in the previous century, proliferation of spreadsheets proprietary systems with their own databases have created a hodgepodge of non-integrated data systems that we're all still suffering from. And Paul said it correctly, technical debt, right? Secondly, the data model is backed by an industry that has done this for all data that is subservice, as I mentioned, right? No of the benefits from five years of data standardization, right? And we're not yet finished, right? There's still a lot of um, ways to go. We just have to do it above ground. 
for all industry. Um, and do not forget that 70, I think it's about 73% of all em em emissions globally is actually caused by those um, energy companies that I mentioned before, right? So they have a vast experience with managing that data, not only for subservice as well above ground. And lastly, the open group, they have proven they can deliver standardization in IT. They did it with Unix and all major OSs like Android, Mac OS and Unix are a core. Even Windows I hear is turning a corner, but I'll leave that up to you, Steve. <laughs> yes, let's not go there right now. But, but um, the, the, it's, it's a great point you make that we're building on something we know works, um, both the, the approaches that we're taking, but also uh, actually building on the, the OSTU for which ironically, um, I say ironically, maybe these things aren't just thrown together. That is the subject of, uh, of next week's Toolkit Tuesday, but um, I'll save that for, uh, for then. But we're, we're building on something right, but uh, delivered by the energy companies. But what you guys are doing in the Open Footprint Forum is really relevant across, uh, across all industries, as far as I can see. Every, every industry is going to need to do this reporting. Is that, is that not the case? Absolutely correct. And, yeah. and that's why it's so important, particularly because of scope three, where you look in, have to look into your supply chain, right? Then based on, let's say, a recipe or a bill of material, you somehow have to figure out what is the carbon footprint of the product that I'm making, right? And then you have to sell that product, right? That's the downstream part, right? So it has an impact on all the industries, right? And as Paul mentioned in the, in the beginning session, Right. There is as well a look into what does it mean for uh, for software, right? Uh, we're as well involved with the Green Software Foundation. We've actually developed a software carbon intensity model. So you could calculate based on AI or blockchain or whatever, what would be the carbon intensity per, let me call it serving, whatever that serving is, right? Is it per hour? Is it per PC? Is it per blade is it per process or per transaction right that's possible to do right right and so far how would you describe the the uh, adoption of industries uh, around this data model i mean it's still work in progress i think is an important point but but uh, how would you describe the adoption levels yeah, I, I think the exciting thing is that, first of all, the big three hyperscalers are committed. Um, yeah. I've mentioned them already. Um, that is uh, AWS, that's Microsoft with Azure, and it is Google with uh, Google Cloud Platform, right? And secondly, the big four audit, financial audit companies. Um, I myself, I'm from a non-financial audit company called Intertech. Uh, we're heavily involved in ESG assurance. We are collaborating. So last but not least, the largest emitters, I mentioned them before on the planet, right? Responsible for 73% of emissions have committed. So I think that is um, a, a great statement for what we've already achieved. The next target is to get independent software developers to develop cool apps on OFP. Absolutely, I mean, there are lots of uh, lots of other things to leverage from from inside the open group there on the on the architecture side, on the data model side. There are there are various things, and uh, so I, th I think I I I would predict some uh, cooperation and collaboration between um, uh, in, individuals in different forums in the open group too on this. Um, but also a point I you you made early on your slide, and I realise um, until people get these and have the chance to look at them again, they may not have been able to see clearly some of the organisations involved. But we always at the open group uh, are very open to cooperating with other organisations working in the same space. There's no need to, uh, uh, th there's enough work to be done without um, uh, redoing stuff. So we're, uh, we're, we're, you've mentioned a couple of specific alliances, and I think that's a key part of moving forward with this group. So That's correct, Steve. Great stuff. So one, one uh, question that I'm sure people, your call to action was, uh, we need your help. What could people expect um, uh, in terms of a time commitment? Because obviously we all have, uh, we all have day jobs, you all have day jobs. Um, 
How, how much of a commitment is this to uh, participate and make a difference in this way? I think it really depends how much you like to be involved. Um, you know, I'd say a minimum of one hour per week to attend, you know, a set of workshops or uh, whatever you want to be, you know, close to. I must admit that in between Teams and Zoom meetings these days, I look forward to get my hands dirty on some carbon data because there <laughs> is so much to learn, right? And I'll leave it at that. Back to you, yes. Steve. Yeah, I appreciate it. AJ, we'll leave it there um, in the interest of time. Thank you very much for uh, your summary. And uh, uh, I will see you. You will, It gives me a chance to give a, a shameless plug for the Open Group Summit event in London, April 17th to the 20th at the uh, QE2 Centre in Westminster. And uh, uh, the Open Footprint Forum will be meeting there along with many of the other forums of the Open Group. So uh, I, I look forward to seeing you there, AJ, and uh, thank you for all you do. Thank you. Okay. So that's it for today's topic, but uh, we have a uh, another one next week. Uh, as some of you will know, we're on a weekly cadence right now leading up to that uh, the summit I just mentioned in London. And uh, next week's topic will be on the OSDU, the Open Group OSDU forum data platform. Uh, AJ mentioned that that's been, uh, a lot of that work has been leveraged uh, by the Open Footprint forum. Um, but the, the OSDU forum has really been um, an incredibly successful, uh, highly active and participatory group that's uh, been going in the Open Group for some time. And they are, they are really changing the way things are, uh, are happening in the uh, currently in the subsurface world of the oil and gas industry, but now looking to how that can be uh, used, all their work can be can be used and repurposed towards new energy as well. So I'm looking forward to hearing about that. I'll be joined by um, my colleague Dennis Stevens, uh, who's the uh, program director for the OSDU forum. So that's uh, same time, uh, same place next next week. And uh, I do hope you can join us for that. Uh, it's a great story we have there. And in the meantime, thank you for joining us today and keep safe and well wherever you are in the world. I'm Steve Nunn. Thank you for watching Toolkit Tuesday.